Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Simon Cathro. Um, I'm the founding partner of Cathro and Partners, and uh, we have uh, made a decision to to run a series of uh, uh, about insolvency and restructuring personalities, and we're calling it the Cut. Um, the show is being produced and directed by Kira Yu, my manager within the firm, and we're here to to roll out our very first episode and uh you know we're, we're very thankful that um our, our first guest is the most probably the most important guest in our industry and he's a uh, president that's right i got that right president and ceo close ceo enough. president close same enough. thing of the uh, reader uh reader's <laughs> our representative body for the industry and um and i think for, for for the people that watch this and, and i know another number of the people that will be watching this are, are people that are not part of the industry and it's really important for us to to get out the message around who we are what we're about and um i think to to have john kick off the series around this it, it's important because you know there's a lot of misunderstandings in our industry and, and the purpose of this series is really to, to educate people about what we do and our skill set and why we do it and the, and the tough decisions that we have to make so um, and we'll also get to know these people personally and get a bit to know about a bit, a bit about their background and, and what they do and, and where they're heading. So, um, you know, it's a pretty relaxing conversation and it's the first time I've done a podcast, so bear with me, but, uh, you know, hopefully I'll get better at it over the, over, the, over the period. But John, welcome. How are you? Thanks, Simon. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for look, accepting the invite. It's, it's really appreciated that, 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 that you come along as the first guest, but... Um, Really, I, I just think it's important for us to, to get to know people, and, and, and you're a very important person in our industry. I mean, you, you obviously are the CEO of Arita, and you, you, you do a lot of things for our industry. You, you get up in front of um, you know, government and, and represent us, and you get in the media and represent us very well. And uh, I just thought, thought maybe just, to, just as a way of a bit of background, just give a bit of background on yourself and where you came from and, and what, you, what you did in terms of your career. So it, kindly, I'm referred to as having a portfolio career. That's the fancy way of saying I've done a few things along the way. Uh, so I actually started out life as an economist, uh, and uh, that effectively means you spend most of your time in the media, and that rolled on to a career in media and public relations for me, uh, which included a lot of crisis management stuff. For example, I was the Director of Communications for the Rural Fire Service for many years. Yeah. Uh, but that sort of evolved into into a marketing career, and when you've had a portfolio career, you end up managing an association. So I actually ran an accounting body, the Australian Operations of a Global Accounting Body, uh, before I joined Arita just on eight years ago. So it's uh, it's been a great time here. Uh, but it's uh, and and what keeps me here, to be frank, is the the fascinating dimensions of of this profession and the work that the members do and the truly great personalities that exist in it, which is why your podcast is going to be so interesting because there's just some awesome people in this profession yeah. and the work they do, just it cries out for getting better attention and better recognition. I, I think people all too often forget the work that insolvency professionals do to save jobs and rescue creditors and that bit needs to have much more sunlight shone on it. Yeah. Like, so, so you, but go back, was it 2014 you, you joined? What attracted you to the role? I was actually approached for the role. Uh, as I said, I was running an accounting body yeah. at that stage. And you know, for people who don't understand, the majority of the insolvency profession, restructuring insolvency and turnaround profession, is made up of fully qualified accountants and lawyers. So it was kind of home territory for me in terms of working with the two-thirds of our members who are fully qualified accountants. But it's that extra dimension, the fact that almost a bit like emergency services and that crisis management thing, you don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. And that was one of the most obvious things to me at the start, the complexity of the work, uh, the fact that insolvency law is the most complex area of corporations law in Australia. And while volume-wise, the tax laws w will exceed it, in true complexity and dimensionality, nothing nothing beats yeah. insolvency law. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that, yeah. So you work with really smart people, and you know that is thoroughly engaging. You genu genuinely don't know what's going to happen one day to the next, though. And you know, one, one day you can be dealing with government, trying to find a way through a new and complex piece of law. The next day you'll be rolling out something brand new in terms of education, lifting the skill set. And the next day you'll be dealing with a crisis where, where, where people are, are losing jobs and you need to provide some information to them. So it's a really wonderful and broad job. And as I said, you get to work with really awesome people. The, the sp does the speed of... 
of, of things that happen in our industry, is it a lot quicker than what you saw in previous roles? Or? Oh, without a yeah. doubt. I mean, and, and yeah. Yeah, great example, this year alone, so we're two months into, into the year, two full months, we, my team have already completed six submissions to government on proposed changes to law. In a normal year, we'd do about 15, but even 15, you talk to most people in other industries and that's unheard of. Mm. And of course, that's one of the things that a lot of people in the general public don't appreciate about insolvency. Complexity equals cost. And government after government keeps bringing in change after change. Uh, it makes it really hard for our members, for the experts in the area to stay on top of that. And, and Rita plays a really big role in making sure that people are across all those changes. But it's a constant activity of managing that process of change, making sure that good policy is what comes into law. Uh, and that's very hard with the level of complexity that we're dealing with. Uh, and then making sure that everybody's across what those changes mean and the impacts that it has on the work that they do. Yeah. So so if we hit COVID and, and, and in the beginning of COVID, um, things just went mad for everyone, right? Not just, just, not just our industry, but we got shot right into the spotlight. Um, and, uh, geez, you must have had a very intense <laughs> few months there. But, you know, we had those new legislations that came in. Like just just t- run me through those few months because that just it must have been the toughest period of your career and and, and potentially the most um, enjoyable too. Yeah, look, it, it it's entirely unlike what anybody externally would have expected. So first of all, there remains this perception that insolvency is going nuts at the moment. That there's lots of activity in the insolvency space. Mm. From the time the government announced JobKeeper Mark II and the array of other changes, including a bunch of insolvency protections that they brought in, insolvency more than halved to its pre-COVID levels. So that's March 2020. Here we are, March 2022. We are still running about 50% below baseline levels. Uh, and so that's a bizarre phenomenon. You, know, you walk down any high street and you see lots of empty shops. You know when you're talking to people in the community about people who are in financial distress, but we're not seeing it in the numbers. So we've gone through this really unusual phase where the community expects insolvency levels are up here. The reality is that they're down here, and that's had a really profound impact on the insolvency profession itself. Uh, but yes, as you said, there was this whole raft of announcements that came really, really quickly. So we had JobKeeper. We had protections around insolvency that involved stopping people issuing statutory demands, the the requirement that you have to pay. Uh, We had protections around commercial leases and a whole bunch of other stuff all come in at once. And at that point, everybody thought COVID seemed to be a really quick issue that was going to be dealt with rapidly. At that point, we were focusing on what we thought was going to be an insolvency tsunami come October when all these protections came off. And of course, then we started planning around that. The government then rolled out a whole range of new uh, insolvency measures, such as the small business uh, restructuring and a simplified liquidation piece. So at the same time as all this is happening, we're dealing with some pretty significant law change and trying to get a regime up and running. And all of those pieces sort of running towards the end of the year, and then the rules got changed again. And so that's been the hallmark of COVID all the way through. The goalposts have kept shifting all the while the profession has had almost no work to do. So it, it, it's been a, an extraordinary year. As yeah. an education body, of course, we relied very heavily on face-to-face education. And so like everybody else out there, we watched our own business evaporate as well. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's kept throwing the curveballs at us all the way through. You're right, that keeps it interesting, there's no doubt. Yeah, I, I mean, I look at our industry and, and we did have a tough, like we had a very tough and, and we didn't get much support. Like uh, other industries had special, you know, you got the vouchers for the hospitality and or, you know, the travel was getting all the special, and, and they should get that. And, and but for us, we had to really survive on our own. Um, most of the other accounting services in that in- industry were actually thriving. Um, M and A and tax and and auditing they all seemed to increase and, and get much much busier. Where we were quite the opposite, and we had to rely on sort of the runoff from older jobs. Um, the thing I found during that period was how often, how much I got it wrong. Like I, I just, I, I, you know, as in, as as practitioners, we 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 network and we connect with a lot of accountants and lawyers, and every single person wants to know where we think the economy is going to go. Um, we're not economists, right? But we we seem to have a, the ear of people, and people respect our our views. And I, I just constantly got it wrong right? in terms of 
when the tsunami was going to come, if the tsunami is going to come. And where I am now is like, I'm not sure. Like it's, you know, the pickup for the industry is still still steady. It's not, it is picked up a bit. Um, the conversations that we are hearing around the industry is that the inquiry rate is picking up. But the inquiry rate has been quite probably probably the say the same the conversion into actual work has actually is where it stopped um the for 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 you um where do you sort of see um the next say 12 months going in terms of and, and it's very hard to predict given there's so many uncertainties at the moment um what, what what's your sort of current view at the moment i keep saying to people simon uh, my crystal ball is getting really tired uh it, it's had a thorough workout over yeah. the last two years um the government, when it moved the goalposts in October 2020 and started smoothing out uh, the stimulus, which was obviously continued into the early part of 21, uh, a lot of the protections around uh, commercial leases, et cetera, were smoothed. Obviously, the banks also had a really significant role to play, and they haven't been enforcing much in the debt space. So what that did was really quickly smooth out that threatened tsunami and, and taper the whole effect out. What we've continued to see is a lot of forbearance in the market being given to people who are in distress. Mm. And that particularly is coming from the ATO, who've done nothing to enforce their debt for two years. So you don't actually have any stimulus for people to look at their own financial distress and work out whether or not they need help or whether or not they've actually got a close-up shop. Uh, and there's an old saying, capitalism without insolvency is like Catholicism without hell. And at the moment, there is no threat of hell. There isn't that thing where people are being asked to stay honest and do the right thing. And so you're getting lots of debt building up. You've also got the fact that so much cash was splashed out through JobKeeper and the other stimulus. And accountants in public practice keep telling us, keep telling people like you, our members, that they've never seen their clients more cashed up. Balance sheets in businesses that were even distressed going into COVID remain surprisingly resilient. And it's going to take time for those balance sheets to run back down. But make no mistake, a bad business before COVID is going to be a bad business again once they deplete those cash reserves. And so necessarily you are going to see insolvency start to pick back up and pick back up. We think fairly progressively, and it's not going to be accelerated uh, activity. Uh, but those businesses will have to start to face their own structural issues. And that's a good thing for the economy. Every economy requires a level of insolvency to renew capital. If you take inefficient capital, move it back into being more productive through an insolvency process, you do the right thing for every economy. That's how you drive yeah. product, productive yeah. growth. But the real issue is going to be, what's the ATO and the banks going to do, Simon? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the banks remain out of the market. We continually hear that banks will do everything they can to avoid pushing or to avoid being the organisation that pushes somebody or a business into an insolvency process. Post Hain Royal Commission, they simply don't want to be the bad boys. The biggest player in the market has always been the ATO. Yeah. The, they would wind up more than half of the businesses in the marketplace. And they do that because as, uh, as supposedly a model creditor, they have a responsibility to do it, even where it might not be economic to do so. Uh, but once we hit March 2020, the ATO ceased virtually all of its collections activities. They gave huge amounts of payment opportunities to, to people uh, and they stopped issuing things like director penalty notices, garnishee notices and even statutory demands. And they haven't restarted that. Mm -hmm. And quite simply, they're not going to start that again until after the election. Yeah. There's no way that the federal government will tolerate a front page story where the ATO has dropped the hammer on some poor mum and dad who've been now flood affected and COVID affected, uh, th that headline is something the government couldn't tolerate and they won't. So we're not going to see a change until the second half of this year. Just just on the ATO, like I've been in the industry for 25 years and, and you know, I think back in 1996, I think it was when I, I joined the industry and, um, uh, and I looked at the collection procedures back then and they were pretty poor from the ATO. They, they, there was... There was a sense of almost entitlement of these underperforming businesses using the tax as a working capital facility. Um, and then I, I think in, in fairness to the ATO, they really got good at it. They, they, they came in with new laws, the GST laws, the DPNs, and they, you know, their systems really improved. And, and so we started to see within businesses a more level playing field. 
Um, and, and I started to see certainly many of the insolvency jobs I took debts that weren't very old like you know they were, might have been 12 months old and then the ATO started to, to take some action so we we started seeing the cleaning out of these unprofitable businesses most of which were driven by poor management or people that just didn't have the skill set to be able to, to do it what I'm worried about now is we've had two years of non-collection and almost this creation of a sense of entitlement of I don't need to pay my tax so are we going to sort of reverse the last 10 years of effort by the ATO into a, a position where we've got these people that just expect uh, to, to – and it could become very political too because of the fact that people just go, well, I'm entitled to job keeper and job saver and you should have given me a grant and I should be getting all these waivers and, 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 and I, you should be giving me a five-year payment plan. But do you think it's ever going to get back to the kind of st- – let's now call it the strict enforcement from the ATO – that, that was there pre-COVID to, to, to post-COVID, or do you think there's a bit of a change? Yeah, look, I think this is one of the most important discussions that needs to happen, not just within our profession, but within the economy as a whole, Simon. Uh, go back six years, and the ATO had a very clear mantra. It was right amount, right time, and no unfair advantage to non-payers. And those two things are absolutely cornerstone principles of good tax collection. The right amount, right time means, obviously, that people are not accumulating more debt that they can handle. And let's not forget that the majority of tax that businesses collect is actually not their money. So things like GST is actually collected on behalf of the government. It's not something that's part of your revenue in a normal sense. You're holding it on behalf of the government. It needs to be paid. Same as your employees, super. Yeah. Uh, but the right amount, right time, while that's important, the more important part is no unfair advantage to non-payers. And if you think about that in context, you've got two hairdressers side by side in in a street. One's paying their tax and doing the right thing. That means that the the money that comes in is then going back out to the ATO. The hairdresser next to them isn't. What they're doing is using the cash from the GST or from their employees' wages to finance the ongoing operation of their business. Who's got the advantage? Well, it's the non-payer. And what we've allowed over the last two years is the non-payer to have this massive advantage over the person trying to do the right thing and run the business in the right way. Mm. That undermines everything in the proper operation of the economy. So we've created this moral hazard. And now we're continuing to say two years on, don't worry about it, Simon. Don't pay your tax. You're okay. We'll do any deal just to keep you rolling along. And that isn't fair. So we've educated uh, not just those businesses, but the bunch of business advisors, and particularly the dodgy pre-insolvency advisors out there, to tell their clients, don't pay your tax, don't worry. And, and that just creates this massive inequality. So I think it's going to take a long time for that behaviour to be changed. And quite frankly, the only way it's going to change is some pretty heavy-handed enforcement and solid messaging coming out from the ATO as they start to wind back in what is a record debt book for them. And they've yeah. got to wind that debt book back yeah. in. I mean, that is our money. That's what's going to pay for submarines and pay for all, all of that other stuff that gets promised at yeah. election times. And they're big bills that have to be paid. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the collectible debt, I think, is $60 billion or something. It's just extraordinary. And I think that's three times more what was pre-COVID. And it's just, it's just amazing that that number is so ma- massive. But then, like anything in the last two years, there's been some incredible experiences just just on moving into a sort of a, a new area there, the, the industries that have been most impacted. Um, I mean, ASIC talks about um, you know, hospitality, constructions and retailers being the most impacted. Have you got any thoughts on industry around that and, and what, you, what, your th- uh, what your thinking is around there? Yeah, and look, this is a frequent discussion we have with ASIC. And so what a lot of people might not be aware of is that we spend a lot of our time behind the scenes closely, both formally and informally, liaising with ASIC and AFSA about where we see the stresses in the marketplace, trying to make sure that everybody's as informed as possible from a policy perspective. But for a long time, since the start of COVID, we've been really quite worried about retail uh, and about hospitality for the obvious reasons. They're some of the most profoundly affected by the shutdowns. And I have really good relationships with the ARA and and uh, and with the uh, Restaurant and Catering Association. And we've seen the patterns. But it's interesting because even within those areas, some retailers, as we know, have had 
record periods. Yep. Uh, others, so high street shops, for example, have suffered terribly because they haven't been able to continue to trade their business. It's the same sort of deal with, with hospitality. You've had some venues which have actually done really quite well, particularly those outside CBDs. Once they've got through the shutdowns, you can't keep the people away because people are staying around their homes. So there's pockets within there that are doing pretty well, and there's others that are not. Uh, construction is a really different issue, though, and this begins to show some of the stresses that are genuinely in the economy, because I'd add transport to that, too. That's another sector yeah, that's okay. starting to see some right. strain. Construction, though, in particular, is suffering because virtually every one of their contracts are fixed price. That's the way construction shifted over the last few years. We've now just seen the collapse of ProBuild, one of the biggest builders yeah. in Australia, uh, and it was entirely predictable. Not that it was ProBuild that was going to go, but one of the big firms, if not more, were going to have to carry so much in the way of underperforming contracts that it was going to force them into significant financial distress. And so what we're seeing is supply chain costs that have gone through the roof. We know that the supply chain prices are elevated about 20% uh, over the last year, uh, which is also an inflationary pressure, which is a significant factor yeah. to deal with in the economy. Yeah. But those prices mean that every job that those big firms and small firms are on, they're losing money, and it's just not sustainable. Mm. So construction is going to continue to see a big shakeout, and I think we're going to see a profound change in the way that prices are quoted by construction firms, they're not going to take as much of the risk. They're going to pass it back to the developer or the home owner who's getting the house built, etc., because they just can't afford to keep doing yeah. it. Yeah, the cost plus contract will become much more popular. Well, it's, it's, it's always been there, but much more uh, popular, I suppose. But yeah. but look, I, yeah, just on construction, I, I think when you sort of look around the major cities of, of Australia, um, you see a huge amount of, of, of activity and you think, geez, we've got a lot of construction. It's a big construction. But maybe it is. Maybe it is. You know, the other view I have is that there's a lot of things starting but not finishing quickly. So so what happens is the natural completion of projects that remo removes a crane from the sky is not there and then suddenly it just looks like the whole city's under construction when, in fact, it's, it's the slowing down of, of the construction project being completed. Um, Which is a supply chain issue too. That's yeah, part of what's driving the costs yeah. up. But, but I think, Simon, you're right. The level of construction activity, as in number of sites that are open for business, is huge. Yeah. But the problem is they're unprofitable jobs for everybody that's in the market. Yep. And when you've got that many jobs on the run, all of which are unprofitable, you have an absolute recipe for disaster in an industry sector. And, and I think that's what we're facing. So construction is going to go through a really big shake-up. And, and construction, as everybody knows, has a very significant multiplier effect on the economy because you've got the tradies, you've got all of the network that supports them. Uh, that, that whole thing multiplies the spend that goes into every construction project. Take that out and you've got a really big drain on the economy. Yeah. Yeah, and and look again, it'll be interesting to see where most of the tax debt sits because in the twenty five years I've seen it, construction's always had the largest percentage of insolvency, and uh, it is the largest industry, so it's only reasonable that they are the largest. But they do also seem to have the most extreme amount of insolvency as well, where where they do tend to use the tax as their working capital. They do see uh, some builders, and not, and I'd say not many, but some builders see it as as as, as their their way of of uh, running a business and, and, and never having to pay it. Um, some of the most extreme uh, phoenixing activity uh, that I've seen uh, and has is, is been in the construction space. Absolutely. Um, usually in that subcontractor space. And um, so, so it's going to be interesting to see when we talk about all those great efforts the ATA did around getting the collection into a really good rhythm and people wanting to, people paying their tax on time, then just losing that sort of momentum because of COVID. And now, what, how severe is that going to be when you've got the construction and 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 and, and what's happening there now? But uh, well, and this is why Simon, I I have some reticence to be excited about things like the recent GDP numbers showing that you know we've got yeah. really big bounce backs in economic activity. I think they're fairly short-term aberrations. I think what we're going to see is over time that there's going to be a catch-up where businesses are going to really have to confront the actual reality that they're facing. And, and you're going to have this snowball effect running through the economy. So while people are all excited that the post-COVID recovery is, is peaking, putting aside what's happening in Europe at the moment, uh, I still think that there's some pretty significant structural challenges for us to face as an economy out there. 
Yeah, the other thing that sort of has happened is there's been permanent changes, like uh, you know, a huge uptake of technology to for, for businesses. Um, I look at just the firm I've just set up, and basically, um, you know, it's been an amazing experience. Certainly, learning in, in setting something up from scratch, and the use of technology. And so, what we're seeing now is some real permanent changes in the way we we shop, in the way we we, we eat. Um, I think the restaurants have been have come back nicely, and, and in some to some extent, it's come, they've come back better, but. But there's those permanent changes. And so what worries me a little bit about if the ATO does go into a changed collection procedure where it's a bit softer, we are going to see this continuation of the unfair playing level and these permanent changes, which actually can create opportunities for, for new business, will, will, won't thrive because the unfair players are continuing to survive when, it, in, in fact, it needs to get cleaned out. So, so, so you can get the new, the new businesses and, and you, you've seen many businesses thrive, many industries thrive through, through, during COVID and that's, that's going to stay. Yeah, and I think that's a really important thing that probably isn't given enough attention. Uh, lots of smart businesses looked at COVID and said, well, we've all had plans to change and improve We've, we've put them off because we were busy. Now we've got to do it because if we don't do those changes right now, we're not going to survive. And, and just an example for us as an education organisation, we'd always relied on face-to-face -face education. We rolled out an online learning management system to do learning on demand. It's a, normally a two-year process. Our operations director delivered it in four weeks yeah. because we had to. Yeah. And, and that's just an example, an analogy that other businesses have had to do in every other instance as well uh, because you've got to do it to survive. And, and when you're faced with that calamity around you, you stop kicking the tin down the road and say, we, this has to be done, it has to be done now, pull out all stops. And so lots of businesses have done that. But you're right, when you look at commercial organisations that have done that, they've had to spend money to get into that, they've taken another risk compared to people who aren't paying their tax, that's a real problem because you want those businesses that bit the bullet and innovated and tried to stay out in front. You want them to succeed. They're going to be the productivity engine room of the economy going forward, not the bloke who can't pay his tax. Yeah. Look, for us... Um, one of the things that I, I, I see in discussions with our referrers, accountants, bankers, wh whoever they are, is they, they reach out to us a lot because, A, we, we have the wonderful opportunity to, to learn different industries. Um, and you know, some of the, one of the conversations that comes up a lot is, are you an industry specialist? And like any insolvency practitioner that says they're an industry specialist is lying. I'm sorry, but, you know... <laughs> We, we, we get a job, we, get, we look at it, and we'll do our best, right? And, and I think one of the great things that our industry has is, you know, you talked about how, how even as an association and a body we had to move so quickly. Yep. That's actually a pretty common thing for our members, right? Absolutely. Because of the fact that, you, you know, we're, we're in a, a studio now, the studio's at the back of a hairdresser shop, and you go, right, okay, well, let's see what happens with the hairdresser shop. That, you know, what happens if it gets into financial distress and suddenly we need to understand it? Um, <clears throat> What I, I try and do with, with our referrers is, is to say, look, f get us involved a lot earlier. You've got the risk cycle of a business. You know, it grows up like this and then it, and it drops down. And the earlier you get us involved, and, uh, and I think it's important, <coughs> certainly for the people that would watch this podcast and, uh, and, and just generally, we're not black hats. We're not just black hats. Yes, we do the liquidation. Yes, we do the bankruptcy. But... The, the number of businesses our members, uh, you know, our inside, uh, restructuring practitioners have saved can't be tracked because of confidentiality, right? Absolutely. But I would argue that we've saved twice as many as, as those that fail because not – and it could be as simple as a five-minute conversation. Someone rings me up and says, Simon, I've got this, this, and this. I think we need to put it on. I go, no, no, you don't need to put it into liquidation. I said, you just need to do this. You've got refinancing – You've got distressed private equity. You've got all these other av avenues, right? And, you know, one, you know, Safe Harbour. Like, that, to me, I think Safe Harbour is an evolving thing still. It's only been around for five years or what, four and a half, whatever it is. And, and essentially, we've got a long way to go. We don't have much precedent in court, and, and so it shouldn't be because it's a commercial solution uh, where liquidation, bankruptcy, it's heavily, uh, heavily reliant on legislation. Do you, 
you know, do you have any sort of comments to add to that to, to around sort of, you know, for those that are, are, are looking at our industry and saying, right, okay, what do you provide? Because I think it's much, much more than often what people think. Yeah, look, uh, you're absolutely right. The one thing I would say, the, the community has this perception of the black hat operator. You know, they have this perception that liquidators, and the name in some ways is a bit unfortunate in terms of what we have to, to deal with yeah. and what that carries. But I, I, I deal with virtually every one of the nearly 700 liquidators in Australia. In all the discussions I've had with liquidators over the last eight years, not one of those discussions has ever been, I'm so stoked that I liquidated this business. Yeah. I have had lots of discussions, however, where they say, I am so stoked I saved this many hundred jobs or I turned this business around. No liquidator gets excited about yeah. bayoneting, bayoneting the wounded and burying the dead. Yeah. It's the unfortunate part of the job. It's the necessary part of the job sometimes. But what motivates the vast majority of insolvency specialists is to get in and save a business because that's the stuff. You sit there with your mates afterwards and feel confident to be able to tell people about, to, to brag about, and rightly so. Yeah. And, and if you can't save a business, the next group you try and save are the creditors. So you're act- people keep forgetting that the insolvency practitioner's job is to, if you can't save the business, which is also indirectly saving the creditors, of course, your job is to do your very, very best to make sure that there's not more insolvencies down the supply chain because of the poor management of that business. And that's the part that keeps getting missed in the narrative. So what insolvency practitioners do is save people. And, and we need to be more confident in that narrative and telling people yeah. that that's the work we do. Look, I, I, I believe most of our colleagues are very good communicators. And, and, and look, part of that was forced on us through some of the reporting regime in the legislation, but we are having to manage so many different stakeholders. I mean, the whole process of insolvency um, is funny in itself because the person that comes to you, your relationship, it's usually an accountant or a lawyer or even a a banker, but so more so from the lawyer and the, and the accountant, they're, they're a trusted advisor to the person in financial distress. So their natural tendency is we've got to save that person. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you have the conversation and then you flip into we've got to maximise the return to creditors, we've got to save the business, right? So it's a very difficult course to, to navigate because of the fact that, um, you know, you've got to almost switch hats sometimes. Absolutely. And and But I, I think you're right on this whole saving. Like, I, I think about the ones I've worked on in, in recent years, you know, custom bus, I did, and now it's just signed a 100-bus contract with the New South Wales government. But, yep. you know, and sometimes the feeling of success doesn't happen until two or three years later, yep. right? Um, you know, and a number of the ones where, where I've, I've restructured and sold, they're still around, they're still trading, and there's some of some of the ones that some of my competitors have done are thriving. Yep. And, you know, the, 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 you look at Virgin, right, and you look at what um, Vaughan and his team did and, and you look at how, how uh, and, and Deloitte, I should say, um, it, how well they, they, they managed that and how quick they, they got in and out. Like, and I think that's one thing when I look at the changes that we as practitioners have done and certainly in the last 15 years, we have moved towards a, qu- a very fast, quick solution to save. Um, did you have any sort of thoughts on that? Yeah, and look, yeah, the Virgin one is a really good example because one of the, the most frequent criticisms that the profession gets is around the cost. And I've already mentioned the complexity uh, of the insolvency laws is part of what drives costs. But Virgin's a really good example of the complexity of the work that drives the cost. Now, you need absolute gurus in to be able to pick a business like that up and flip it around and keep it alive, especially during a crisis like COVID. Yeah. But yeah, as, as an example for, for the listener, an aircraft is not just an aircraft. It's not just owned by the airline. Uh, that aircraft can be uh, a lease from another company, but then it's got four engines on it. Those four engines are probably owned by three different companies and they're not the engine that's normally on that plane when it was delivered because they cycle those engines around the different planes. When you decide in the middle of an insolvency that that plane has to be handed back, you've got to track down the other three engines and get them back on or hand them over to the people that it's from. Trying to even track that down and work out where they are 
that's a complex job in and of itself. Yeah. And and I think a lot of people don't appreciate just how much skill goes into that or, importantly, how incredibly effective the voluntary administration process is to try and achieve that type of turnaround. The extraordinary power that it gives an administrator to look at the, the balance sheet of a business and say, I'm moving that and I'm putting that there. I'm disclaiming that. I'm moving this out. The ability to shuffle the pieces on the chessboard to get the right outcome is truly extraordinary. And, and, and that's the skill, right? Yep. And this is the thing when someone goes, what industry do you specialise in? The industry we specialise in is, is exactly that. And if we can define the word around that skill set because it's about, you know, our skill set is that we are experts in restructuring, okay? It's, we're not expert in putting makeup on or flying a plane or in our salary is doing, you know, building a few sites or something like that. But we're actually experts in actually restructuring your business and looking at the, the, the different challenges, like the four different engines. And one, one's leased with GE, another one's leased with Boeing. I don't know all the different financiers, but it's 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 the industry getting together and, and, and when you do look at something like virgin i suspect pro build will be the same thing there's so many of us that get together on it you've got the the parties on, on for acting for the financiers you've got the parties acting for the directors you've got the sorry i should say advisors not parties mm. advisors acting for uh, in the role of administrator and then the, for the banks and and very much you'll find that when you get a big job there's a, a huge number of us that that have to work together um, and the complexity of, of those big jobs always drives that. And that really leads on to another important point, yeah? Whenever we see these big collapses come up, some uninformed person is going to stand up and say, we need Chapter 11. Uh, and let me be really clear, yeah. we don't need Chapter 11. No. Chapter no. 11 really only works for mega jobs in the US. Yeah. And if anybody thinks the voluntary administration process is expensive... They've never seen the bill that gets attached to a Chapter 11. You did talk about the fact that there are advisors and representatives for all the key stakeholders in a major insolvency. You get them on speed when you run Chapter 11 because you've got to involve lots of lawyers and the court approving every single major move. Mm. The voluntary administration is streamlined in achieving that. You could not flick the switch on a really quick turnaround like they did with Virgin and uh, and we've seen plenty of other examples as well in the same way with the Chapter 11 process. Yeah. And, and the bill, particularly in the Australian environment, would likely render uh, a Chapter 11 process driving that business into a liquidation. And I think you're right. I think you look at the reality of Australian businesses, it, 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 we're not big enough, right? And, and maybe you, you can look at a General Motors over at, in, in the US and say, yeah, it makes a lot of sense because it's a, it's a multi, multi-billion dollar restructure. But we've only had one multi-billion dollar restructure and that's Virgin in the last, I don't know how many years. So, And, and you so, ask the guys who did it and they all say yeah, VA was definitely yeah. the way to go. Look, VA I, for VA. That's <laughs> right. Um, yeah, there, there has been, and it's a great point to sort of pivot on because the debtor in possession stuff, when you, you look at that conversation, Singapore, I think, has brought in some new legislation. Yeah, there might be room to, to, to expand into a, a something, but I think if we were to go down the the, part, the, 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 the Chapter 11 um, route, I think it would be a real mistake. Um, yeah, and so, so one of the things, so debtor in possession... For, certainly for those who, who might not be in the profession who are listening, basically means that the company that's in distress remains under the control of the management that's yeah. there. Uh, I think Australians have a big cultural issue with that. If you look at the t any time that a business collapse, our community expects that people who led the underperformance of a business should be paying some sort of price for what they did. There is an expectation, we are a little biblical in that, in that we still think that there, there is a level of punishment required for those who suffer down the chain. Uh, and that's our egalitarian society coming yep. to the fore. But a debtor in possession model, a Chapter 11 model or any of the smaller versions of it, is effectively built around debt forgiveness. It forces the creditors down the line to pay the price or whatever the business did that led it to be in that financial distress. And generally, those creditors get less of a choice in a debtor-in-possession model than they do in the creditor-friendly Australian model. And, and that needs to be remembered. So there's a global discussion about, particularly for small to medium enterprises, having more debtor-in-possession models. Quite simply, those are cramming down the debts for those small creditors and forcing 
the penalty onto the creditors. Mm. Now, there's a problem with that in that the creditors are the least informed in that value chain. The debtor, the person driving the business, is the one that knows that they're not able to pay the bills. The creditors, often small creditors, just do not have the information access to be able to make that assessment. Uh, and some of them just have to keep doing business in the vein, hope that they're going to get paid. But they don't know that that business isn't paying its ATO bill. They don't know that it's not paying the others. Yeah. So that's the problem with the debtor in possession model. It actually disenfranchises the poor mum and dad in the little business down the value chain who are just hoping to get paid for providing the little boxes that they make that's given to the big business. Yeah. Do you think it's promoting an unfair playing field? Yeah, because, as I said, I think there's – if you look at the most basic economic theory, it is that there's perfect access to information. That simply doesn't exist. Mm. And as I said, if you look at who has all the information in that arrangement, it's the debtor. It is the company that's making the decisions. It's not the supplier. And so when you get to the point of collapse of a business, where's the logic that says – the disenfranchised creditor who didn't have the information to make a fully informed decision should be further punished in favour of the other one. Now, we do get caught up in this view of we have to keep the jobs going. And I understand why. There's a very human consequence to that. There's also a human consequence to the creditor too. But if we're completely focused on propping up bad businesses, that drives poor productivity outcomes. Yeah. And it goes back to yeah. that really basic notion of you sometimes need an insolvency to clean out inefficient and ineffective businesses. Yeah. And I think that the, the point that's relevant to that as well is that I come back to my earlier comment that we probably fixed double the amount of businesses that you don't hear about. Yep. And they're the ones that need saving and should be saved because they're not playing the un, unfair playing field. The ones that have got down the risk cycle and it's, it's in the insolvency part of that cycle, you know, it's, it's very hard. It's very hard to, to, to change path there. And so to, to, to create a, a solution that, that basically continues to keep these people around, um, is that fair on those that, are, that have, have, have picked the, the issues as, as they've just got to, you know, started to dip over the, the, the growth cycle and fixed it earlier, where these ones have left it for so long, um, you know, not paid their tax for two years. Exactly, which comes back to your early comment around should businesses, should the owners of businesses who start to notice that they're in distress be asking for help earlier? Yes, because yep. while they might know their product really well, they might be absolute engineering experts or whatever, they don't know <coughs> Excuse me, what the tips and tricks are to try and turn their business around and make it profitable, yeah. as our members do. Yeah, but to, as a final message um, for those that are not in the industry, I think, you know, what, what, what do you think is important for them to, to appreciate when it comes to our industry? Yeah, look, I think it is the level of expertise uh, th that exists in the industry. As you said, the ability of insolvency practitioners to look at pretty much any business and know what's wrong with it, that's, that's quite a unique skill. Uh, and of course, it, it's important to say that in, in some industry sectors, for example, in agri, you know, any insolvency practitioner who takes an appointment over a complex farm is going to bring an expert in to back them up so they know what the right feed is for the cattle and all of that sort of thing. But, but that expertise is really second to none. Uh, the perception out there that insolvency costs too much, I really think that's something that needs to be addressed. To bring in that level of expertise doesn't come for free. Uh, but there was, there was an inquiry into the Chapter 11 process in the, U, in the US, and there was a line in there that reminded uh, everybody that creditors only get what they get because of the expertise of the insolvency practitioner that's brought in. And if you want a good outcome, then you're going to need to bring in a guru. Unfortunately... Creditors often don't get paid at all because the insolvency practitioner was asked to come in far too late. Yeah, absolutely. You, there's nothing left to save. The, the, the business is so far in the negative that even the insolvency practitioner doesn't get paid. We did a survey some years ago of our members. $120 million a year gets written off by the 700 insolvency practitioners in Australia in fees that they couldn't recover because – there wasn't enough money even for them to get paid, let alone the creditors. And that's one of the things that people need to understand. It's not a bunch of shiny suits showing up to get rich. And as we know, there's not that many rich insolvency practitioners out there these days. No, not at all. <laughs> those, those days are, are long gone. Yeah. And, you know, it is, it's just a truism that it's complex work, uh, it's valuable work, 
it saves more jobs than it costs. Uh, and, and people need to, to be aware that the insolvency practitioner isn't your enemy. They're, in fact, your best friend. And yeah. I'm reminded very much of uh, one of our board members actually was appointed to a very big job, very complex and controversial job. And, and she was working very hard to try and save this business and, and, and flick it around. And she was meeting with the unions and she was trying to explain to them the process that she was going through. And the leader of the trade union turned around to her and said, you don't need to explain it to me. I know you're on my side. And that's one of those moments where you do stop and, 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 and need to be reminded of that yourself sometimes. Mm. You're working to save those jobs anyway. If the jobs have got to go, it's because somebody else messed it up. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. We're delivering the truth. Yeah. And uh, often the truth is, is, is uh, confrontational. But, um, John, thank you very much. I really Absolute appreciate pleasure. you sort of being my first guest. And, uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully this is a good podcast series and, we, and this uh, helps people better understand our industry. Um, but we've got the second uh, second. Uh, um, Second episode coming up, we've got uh, Adrian Lader from Allegro, so we've uh, kick off with him and uh, he's going to talk all things distressed private equity and probably a bit of toll, So, but thank you everyone and uh, feel free to, uh, to reach out to us and make any comments and uh, John Winters, our CEO of our industry and uh, he's, a, he's been a great representation for us for the last uh, eight years almost eight years, now, eight, eight years. years, yeah, but thank you very much. And just to wrap up, uh, if you want to subscribe to the podcast, you can uh, through YouTube, iTunes or Spotify, please uh, register. Um, that will give you access to all the upcoming episodes over, over the 10-part series. And uh, if the whole series is a success, uh, the second season. So thank you very much.